unusual animal. It's a collection of strange parts, you know, tusks and a trunk and big ears. And it's, it's not an animal you'd ever design. Uh, it works very well. And I think ASEAN is much the same in the sense that there's huge diversity across ASEAN. Um, every single level of development, every culture, every religion, um, every language, um, economic system, political system, it's one of the most diverse groups of countries in the world. And yet, when you bring it together, it actually works, in our view, quite well, and it's starting to work quite well. So, elephant because it's big, elephant because it's a collection of unusual parts, uh, and an elephant because it's starting to attract lots of attention. So, I'm going to explain some of the, the, the sort of research we've done into this block, but I thought it'd be useful to start by just setting the scene about where we think the global economy is going, and what that means for Asia, and then look at Southeast Asia against that sort of context, that backdrop. Uh, because governments withdrew from their economy and let the, the economy stand on their own feet, and things slowed down. And then last year, 2012, it slowed down even more because governments were stepping back, but also because there was a lot of uncertainty around. There was an election in America, leadership transition in China, lots of worries about the future of the euro currency. Uh, so companies were a little bit cautious uh, about investing, so they were holding back from hiring, holding back from investing, so things slowed down last year. Uh, the good news is that this year we think the economy is going to pick up and return to growth. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a better performance we're expecting this year. But it's not particularly exciting. Um, if you look at 2013, it's only marginally better than 2012. The world is still in a fragile state. There are lots of risks around. Although we think things are getting better, they're not getting much better. They're getting a little bit better. The other thing to point out here is the red line, which is Asia's economic growth. And two things to point out. One is that Asia is not decoupled from the rest of the world. So whatever happens in the rest of the world also impacts Asia. Those two lines move in the same way. But Asia's economic performance, its economic growth, is about four to five percentage points faster than the world. And we think that outperformance will remain. So even if we did go into recession this year, Asia would certainly feel it, but its outperformance would still be four to five percentage points. Asia is faster growing than the rest of the world. But our core view, a slight recovery this year, but unexciting in the sense that it's still quite low growth. Uh, there are three main engines driving the global economy at the moment. There's America, which is about $15 trillion. There's Europe, which is about $16 trillion. And then there's China, which is about $8.5 trillion. And if you add them all up together, um, it comes to about two-thirds of the global economy. So if you want to know where the global economy is going, you have to know where those three places are going. Uh, and one of the problems facing the world is that two of those engines are saddled with a huge amount of debt. And that's what is shown on this chart here. The red line is America, the blue line is Europe, and it shows you the value of debt relative to the value of the overall size of the economy. This is total debt, bank debt, government debt, household debt, every kind. And for most of history, debt's equal to about one and a half times the size of the economy, 150% of GDP. And then in the early 1980s, uh, Western markets went on this credit super cycle, they went on this borrowing binge. And that was one of the main engines driving their economies, the fact that everyone was taking on more and more and more debt year on year. And you can see that debt went from 150% of GDP to nearly 400% of GDP in the space of 30 years. Clearly this is unsustainable, um, it's not sensible, it has to stop at some stage and it now has stopped with the global financial crisis. <laughs> Um, and so that means that one of the main engines of Western growth has been taken out of action, this credit super cycle, this credit driven growth. But worse than that, it now needs to go into reverse. People need to pay back their debt. And so we're in this deleveraging cycle, this paying back of debt, cleaning up the balance sheets. And as this deleveraging happens, it's going to mean that the global economies, or certainly Western economies, are very, very weak for uh, many years to come. What's interesting is that if you look at the red line, you can see it's starting to come down. So debt in America is starting to come down. It's not because Americans are being good, <laughs> repaying their debts, 
uh, it's because they're defaulting on their debts. So, um, you know, rather than pay off their mortgage, they're just sending the keys back to the bank and, and giving up on it. Uh, it gets the debt off the balance sheet, although it's very painful for the banks, obviously. In Europe, which is the blue line, they haven't even started yet on trying to pay back the debt. There's a long, long way to go there. A um, quick word on what's going on in America. Uh, we're quite optimistic on America. We think there's lots of reasons to be uh, confident about the outlook. Chart on the left is unemployment. Um, after the crisis, it hit 10%. It was a big problem. But since the crisis, you can see that the unemployment is coming down. The American economy is creating jobs. Unemployment is still much too high, at uh, about 7.8%. Uh, but the American economy is creating jobs. Unemployment is coming down, so that gives us cause for optimism. The second thing is the chart on the right, which is house prices. And house prices are very important for America. Um, you can see that they went up very sharply during the boom years before the crisis. The crisis struck, house prices fell. We think they've now hit a bottom, hit a floor, and are starting to go back up a little bit. And the reason they're important is several. Um, about 70% of American consumers' wealth is tied up in the value of their house. So when houses are prices are falling, Americans feel poor and negative and they don't spend. When house prices are going up, they feel rich, they go out and they spend. So that's very important for consumer confidence. And of course, it's important for a whole load of other industries like construction, real estate services, furniture, all the other things that go into uh, the housing sector. The third thing that gives us confidence about America is that balance sheets, corporate balance sheets, are very, very healthy. American companies are sitting on record amounts of cash. Um, the reason why is because they haven't been investing, they haven't been hiring, they haven't been spending. They've been too concerned about the outlook. But when confidence returns, American companies are very well placed to start investing into the recovery. The debt problem in America is government debt and household debt, consumer debt. It's not corporate debt. Corporates are actually in very good financial health. So we think that uh, America is going to do quite well this year, growing at about 2 2.5%, um, um, which is a little bit low by American standards, but is perfectly acceptable in the current weak state of the global economy. So America looking okay. What's much more worrying is Europe. Um, Europe is obviously in recession. The European economy shrank last year. Uh, we think that uh, many parts of Europe are in depression, places like Greece and Portugal and Spain, clearly in depression. Um, and once again, the problem is all about debt, um, and in particular government debt. Government debt is too high in Europe, and they're going through these austerity measures to try to bring their debt down. And that's very painful, because if governments are not spending their, their saving by paying back debt, it means that uh, they're not spending in their economy and economies are shrinking. Um, however, despite the problems in Europe, we're actually quite optimistic that the picture is improving um, for several reasons. Um, one is the actions by the European Central Bank in July last year. Um, the Central Bank Governor, Mario Draghi, he came out and he said, we will do whatever it takes to save the Eurozone. And what he means is, he will print money to buy government bonds. He will print money to fund governments. And um, what you can see in the two charts here are borrowing rates. For they become insolvent. They become bankrupt. They can't afford to roll over their debt and when they're paying that much to borrow. But below 5.5%, governments return to health. They can afford to keep rolling over this debt. It gives them enough time to put in place the reforms that they need to address their, their weak economies. So simply by saying this, or threatening it, or promising it, depending on where you come from, to print money, the bond market borrowing rates have come down, and that gives these countries enough time to start paying off their debt uh, and reforming their economies and returning to financial health. So the actions of the European Central Bank, essentially saying we will act as a lender of last resort to European governments has been very important. Um, but there are other things too. Um, and one of them is uh, the fact that um, uh, Europe is returning to competitiveness. Um, during the boom years before the crisis, 
when Europe was living off debt growing year on year on year. Wages went up, incomes went up, but productivity did not. And so uh, the competitiveness of Europe deteriorated. And what you can see in the chart here is unit labor costs. Um, and you can see that during the boom years, when governments were borrowing and then spending very generously, wages went up, and these economies lost their competitiveness. And then the crisis struck, and suddenly Europe woke up and realized we've got no competitiveness left. And normally what you do in that situation is your currency devalues, and you regain competitiveness through a falling currency. But when you're locked into a currency union, you can't devalue your currency. So instead of going through external devaluation, countries in Europe are now going through internal devaluation, where their wages are falling, their incomes are falling. And it's a horrible process, and it's very painful, but that's what's happening. And you can see that in Europe, these unit labor costs are now coming back down again as incomes fall, as wages fall. And this is a very important part of the healing process, even though it's horrible to live through. Uh, and uh, it means that competitiveness is returning. So if you look at a country like Spain, um, investments coming back into Spain, Ford Motor Company recently said that it would build a new car factory in Spain. Spain is now exporting cars to China. Uh, because wages have come down, competitiveness has returned. And this is an important part of the healing process after the years of excess that Europe has lived through. So we think there's lots of reasons to be optimistic around for uh, Europe. Um, we think that Europe is going to have another year of falling, uh, of shrinking economy, another year of recession this year, but not by much. Our forecast is for minus 0.2 this year. So another year of contraction, but it's basically flat. And we think that by the end of this year, the story around Europe will be much more positive. People will look at Europe in a, in a brighter way and think, yes, Europe's on the road to recovery, even though this year is going to be another year of pain. Uh, there is a big risk that things don't go right. We think the risk of Europe breaking up is still 20%. So the Eurozone could still fall apart. There's a lot of political hurdles that need to be overcome. But in general, we're more positive on Europe. The third engine uh, of global growth is China, and here we are much more optimistic. Uh, chart on the left here is the recent history of the Chinese economy, um, economic growth, and I think uh, you, know, you can see the years before the crisis, the economy was growing at a tremendous rate. They were growing at 12, 13, 14 percent. And then the crisis struck and, and, and growth dropped very dramatically. The government responded with the biggest economic stimulus in history. And the way that China does stimulus is it tells its banks to lend money. And it lends money, and then people use that money to build stuff. So they do stimulus through fixed asset investment, building infrastructure, building factories, building houses. And that's exactly what they did in 2009. This huge increase in credit, in bank lending, that went into building infrastructure and houses and so on. But they overdid it. They put too much fuel on the fire. They were causing inflation, causing property bubbles. Their economy was overheating with too much stimulus. So in 2010, they took their foot off the accelerator, they slammed it on the brakes, and they slowed things down uh, deliberately. And, all, and for basically for the last two years, the Chinese economy has uh, been slowing. Uh, until the final quarter of last year. And if you look, you can just see the line has started moving back up again. The Chinese economy, we think, hit a bottom is now um, speeding up. The government has taken its foot off the brake, and they're now letting credit um, and debt build up again in the economy, and that's supporting this growth. So we think growth will pick up this year to about 8.5% compared to last year, which was about 78 So turned around, there's green, green, signs of green shoots from a growth perspective everywhere you look uh, in China. What's quite interesting is the chart on the right, which shows you our long-range forecast for China going out to 2030. And even though we think growth this year is going to pick up, over the next 10, 15, 20 years, growth in China is going to slow down on a structural basis. For the last 30 years, China's been growing 10% a year on average. But we think by 2020, China will be growing about 5% structurally. And then by 2030, China will be growing only by about 3%. So the glory days of Chinese growth are over. And growth in the future for China is going to be much harder and much more challenging. There are a number of reasons for that. One is the fact that a lot of their growth in the past came from exports, and that story has run out of steam. 
China's wages have gone up so much it's no longer competitive, but also global demand is weak, and it's going to be weak structurally for a long time. More important than that is the demographic story. Um, the fact that uh, China's workforce has been increasing year on year, every year for the last 30 years. And when you have an expanding workforce, that naturally drives high growth, because the workforce is getting bigger. But equally, the demographics, uh, you have a, the workforce moving from the countryside into the cities, from the farms to the factories. And when you do that, you become about three to four times more productive. So simply by growing the population and the workforce and moving them into the cities, you drive very high economic growth. But China's workforce has now peaked. It peaked last year. So China's workforce is now declining in size. It's aging, um, and it's not urbanizing at the same rate. So the growth in China is going to fall structurally. It's a much more challenging future for China than it was in the past. So this is our, um, our sort of forecast for the world. Um, our baseline view, 60% probability, um, Europe growing, Europe had another year of recession, um, America growing a little bit above 2%, China 8.5% looking very positive. Um, we have 35% chance of recession. Um, various triggers you can see there, a Eurozone breaking up, it says 30% chance, we've actually reduced that recently to 20%, so um, it's not as bad as that, but uh, nonetheless still a 1 in 5 chance of Eurozone breaking up. Um, America going into some sort of fiscal shock, arguing over the amount of debt that they can take on, how much they can spend, maybe a 1 in 5 chance there. Uh, China crash, China's maybe arguably over invested, it's building too much stuff and this might cause an investment crisis um, because if you build too much capacity, your investments never earn a return, and so you can't repay the debt of a banking crisis. Unlikely, but nonetheless a possibility. So that's our recession scenarios. And then we do have, if you're feeling optimistic or you want some good news, uh, we do have an optimistic view, which is we call mini-boom, uh, but we only give it a 5% chance, unfortunately. Uh, and that's all about money printing. Uh, and the fact that there's policies of quantitative easing around the world, government's printing money, and this money is flooding into the economy, lifting asset prices, it might just stir a revival of confidence, and everyone starts investing, and it becomes a self-sustaining recovery. We think it's unlikely. So that's a sort of a quick tour of the world. Um, let me bring the conversation. What about, what about Japan and India? Japan and India. Okay. Um, well, um, in Japan. Uh, we obviously have this new era of Arbonomics, um, which, yeah, which is based around several key principles. Um, one is uh, huge fiscal stimulus, um, and uh, the government is increasing its debt to support growth in the economy. Um, that, I think, will be positive in we, we three years, because Japan is using this fiscal stimulus. Um, the second part is, is trying to move from using monetary policy to move from deflation to inflation and trying to get the currency to, to fall. Um, they have had some success in, in, in reducing the currency. Um, I'm not sure that it's going to be sustained success. Um, uh, and it's not clear to us that they're going to succeed in beating deflation. Um, so although these, this era of economics has, has sort of got off to a good start in devaluing the yen, and this is the main point, which is that Japan has structural issues in its economy. They need to open up um, many parts of the economy to much more greater competition, particularly the services sector. And unless they can get you know, these, their economy operating much more efficiently and competitive from deflation to inflation, then it means that um, cost of capital in Japan is going to have to go up to reflect that inflation. Um, and the government in Japan is the most indebted government in the world. Um, the government debt is about 240 to 250% of GDP. And so if they move from this deflation environment to inflation and interest rates go up, the government's going to bankrupt itself because it can't afford to pay much higher rates on all of that borrowing. So there are some unintended consequences that we're a little bit worried about in Japan. Um, India. Uh, India, we are... We think India, for much of the past decade, India was growing at, at 9, 9.5%, and, and everyone got very optimistic and excited it was going to emulate China and, and, and grow at 10% for 30 years. Um, we think that that's an aberration. Uh, India's moved back to its historical uh, boundaries of growth, which was often called the Hindu rate of growth. 
basically where the bottom of the growth rate is 4%. It's very difficult for India to grow at less than 4% because the population is increasing, the workforce is increasing. Um, but it's also going to be very difficult for India to grow at more than 8%. Um, <coughs> because as soon as it grows faster than 8%, it starts overheating and inflation breaks out. And um, so we think that India is moving back into this range of between 4 and 8%, and it's going to be very hard to break out of that, which is a huge shame, because India should be emulating China, but it's not going to. Um, having said that, you know, the economy is, uh, this year, I think we're expecting it to grow about 7%, which is you know, still, by global standards, pretty high. Um, and you know, as, as China slows, India will overtake it in terms of its growth rate, even if it's still a much smaller economy. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Can you the FDI on a per capita basis. Um, so you can see on a per capita basis, Southeast Asia is attracting almost the same amount of foreign investment as China, and way more than India. And India is failing in this regard because it's not reforming its economy. It's not opening up its economy to investment. It's not improving its investment landscape. So on the one hand, many companies can't get into India because they're blocked, their access is blocked. But also, um, you know, it's, it's a very challenging environment. They keep changing the tax rules. They keep changing. Uh, the bureaucracy there is terrible. Um, the corruption is terrible. Um, the, uh, the transparency is, is, is bad. So um, India could be attracting investment like China is, but it's failing to create the right investment landscape to bring that investment in, which is a great shame. But I think the important thing is that economic opportunity, and you pick where are the bright spots, and I'm a global company, where am I going to invest my resources? Southeast Asia would feature very highly on that map of global opportunity. It's got very high growth, very resilient growth, um, and it's relatively speaking actually quite an easy place to invest. These countries in Southeast Asia are quite open, quite receptive, um, and quite good places to put your investment if you're a foreign company. Um, the growth in Southeast Asia has taken us a little bit by surprise, because Southeast Asia always used to be quite export driven. A lot of its um, economies were driven by making exports, selling them into Europe and America. But Europe and America have been weak. But despite that weakness, Southeast Asia's growth has continued to stay very strong. And it's been driven by domestic demand. Southeast Asia's domestic demand is actually doing extremely well at the moment um, for a number of reasons. Um, there, are, there are several parts of the domestic demand story. Uh, one, of course, is consumer spending. And consumer spending in Southeast Asia is very robust. And the size of the middle class, the size of the consuming class, is getting larger and larger and larger. So what this chart shows you is the number of households in the middle class in Southeast Asia. And the threshold we use is about a, fa a household income of 5,000 US dollars or more. Below that, you're just spending on necessities like food. And above that, you can start to buy discretionary items like motorbikes, smartphones, and so on. And the number of households that classify as middle class on this basis uh, is basically going to double in six years between 2010 and 2016. Huge swathes of Southeast Asia's population are sitting just below that middle class threshold and are all now moving above it and becoming uh, much more uh, uh, active consumers. And so this is driving this domestic demand story, the fact that consumer spending is very robust uh, and the middle class is becoming so large. So that's the first part of the demand. It's all about investment, fixed asset investment, uh, which, uh, as, as I said, is essentially building things, uh, investing in productive capacity. It's building infrastructure, building factories, building houses, investing in machinery. Because it, it creates economic growth today through the construction activity, and it lays the foundations for all your future economic growth by building. You know, if you build a factory today, you get the construction today, and then you get all the output of that factory in the future. And if you build an airport today, you get the construction today, and then you get the use of that airport for all the to the future. So fixed asset investment is very important. And in Southeast Asia, you can see that during the 19... This is the, the share of the economy made up by fixed asset investment. During the 1990s, many places were investing very heavily, including Malaysia, where you can see that at one stage about 43% of the economy was just building stuff, building fixed assets. Then we had the financial crisis of 97, and fixed asset investment basically stopped 
in the region, including here in Malaysia. And for the last decade, Southeast Asia has been massively underinvesting in its fixed assets. There's an, in, there's an investment deficit. The region has not been building infrastructure, not been building factories and the like. Um, and so now I think we stand on the cusp of a new investment uh, era where countries will make up for the lack of investment over the last 10 years, last 12 years. And as an example, look at Indonesia, which is the red line there. You can see that the investment rate of Indonesia has gone up year on year on year on year. And invest Indonesia is now investing at a rate of um, about 32, 33% of its economy in fixed assets. Sadly, not a lot of it's going into infrastructure. A lot of it's going into high-end apartments. Some of it's going into factories. Some of it's going into uh, new mines and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, so on. But some of it's going into infrastructure. So this is going to drive Indonesian growth. So that's the second part of this domestic demand story, the consumer spending and then this investment story. The second bright thing I think about Southeast Asia alongside this domestic demand is its relationship with China. And what's quite interesting is that in the past, China was always a big competitor for Southeast Asia. Um, and now it's shifting from being a competitor to being a customer. Um, and what the chart here shows you is unit labor costs for a whole range of Asian countries compared to America. I don't know if you can see this, but 100, there's a red line. That is America. That's unit labor costs in America, benchmark, index to that at 100. And then it shows you all the other countries, their unit labor costs relative to America. And if you look at the, red, the blue line, which is China, you can see that China's unit labor costs have gone up year on year on year on year. And they're now at the same level as America. This is uh, China here. Now obviously wages in America are much higher than China, but productivity in America is much higher than China. So the unit labor costs are about the same. This is one of the reasons why manufacturing is starting to move back to America, because it's no longer cheap to do it in China. You can do it for the same cost in North America. Well, I think this creates a very interesting opportunity for Southeast Asia, because suddenly Southeast Asia has become highly competitive relative to, um, to, uh, to, to, to China. Um, so if you look at Malaysia there, which is black, you can see that unit labor costs in Malaysia are only about 45% of what they are in China. You're yeah. cheaper than Indonesian well, You're not cheaper, but you're on a unit labor cost basis you are, because your productivity here is better. Yeah. So your, your, your wages are higher, but your productivity is, is, is higher. So you actually you're, yes, you're more cost effective here, even though you're the labor costs are higher. Um, so if you look at a country like Vietnam, you know, unit labor costs in Vietnam are only 37% of China. So it's not surprising that new manufacturing investment is going into Vietnam instead of China, because China is expensive. So right across Southeast Asia, this creates opportunities, um, uh, uh, because China has become expensive. And so Southeast Asia can now make stuff, and, Ch and, and South China can buy it, and no longer So you've got this domestic demand story, you've got this competitive, return of competitiveness story, and I think the third big important trend in Southeast Asia is the fact that you have this ASEAN economic community unfolding. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware, it was back in 2007 that the ASEAN bloc outlined this vision of this community, but it'll just be a couple of years late. And another 42% think they'll achieve it, but maybe many years later. So it's not about meeting the deadline. Nobody thinks they'll meet the deadline, or very few people. It's about meeting their deadline maybe a little bit late. It's all about the direction of change, not so much the speed of change. And the direction of change is positive. ASEAN is moving towards creating an economic community. It's just doing it more slowly than it's hoping to be. The chart on the right um, shows you, we ask companies, is this meaningful for you? As ASEAN policies create greater integration and bring the region together, is it feeding through into your strategy? 23% um, said yes, ASEAN integration is extremely meaningful, extremely important for our strategy. Another 60% say somewhat important. So companies, whereas in the past they were skeptical about this economic community, increasingly they're bringing it into their strategy and they're building their plans around this integration process. Um, 
Integration is um, move to the next slide. Integration is more meaningful for some companies than others. And it's clearly most meaningful of all if you're in the manufacturing business, if you're making stuff. Um, because here, ASEAN is starting to become a much more single market. Um, tariffs within Southeast Asia are almost zero for almost all products. So we asked our company, these are just manufacturing companies in this survey here, do you use the ASEAN Free Trade Trading Goods Agreement to move goods around the region? And 26% yeah, yes, we use it very frequently, 42% frequently. So these ASEAN treaties creating a single market are being used by companies. One of the big issues is moving goods between countries is customs. You know, goods get locked up in customs, they have to cross multiple borders, then it becomes very burdensome. But ASEAN has this idea of a single window where they try to harmonize customs across the region. You can register your goods with just one customs um, uh, body and then it can move right across the region. And our survey says that customs procedures are becoming much more uniform and much more harmonized across the region. And this is creating this single market. And it has big implications for companies. So while one of our clients who I was talking to last week, big multinational, has manufacturing right across Asia, and uh, right across Southeast Asia. They currently have six factories in Southeast Asia making goods for the domestic markets in those six countries. This year, they're consolidating all of those six factories into one factory in Indonesia, and they're going to serve the whole Southeast Asia region from that one factory because it's becoming a single market, a single production base where customs barriers are falling and it's becoming much more integrated. It's less integrated for services, and it's less integrated for investment. So barriers to foreign investment, of course, still exist in some sectors, and services is not harmonized. But for products, it is becoming better. Of course, there's still a long way to go. It's tariff barriers, as I mentioned, are nearly zero, but non-tariff barriers are a big issue. And this is things like product standards, uh, and product rules and regulations. When we asked people to rank on a scale from naught to three, how harmonized are your product standards across Southeast Asia? And you can see the results. Many, many countries, companies, uh, in many sectors, the harmonization is very low. Products are not standardized, regulations are not harmonized. So there's a lot of way, long way to go in this integration process, but it started and is moving forward. Um, so the top down policies of ASEAN, very important. But I think. Arguably even more important is the bottom-up actions taking place within Southeast Asia by individual people and individual companies. It's quite clear that integration is happening at many different scales within Southeast Asia. You've got the top-down policy in integration from ASEAN, but you also have individual com companies moving across borders, investing in their neighbors, and integrating um, on their own without necessarily waiting for ASEAN to create the perfect market before they do that. So if you look at the, the chart on the left, this is intra-ASEAN visitors, people from one ASEAN country visiting another. And you can see that year on year, the number of intra-ASEAN tourists and visitors has risen sharply. It's gone from 15 million to nearly 40 million. But equally, I think it's about creating scale. And the fact that if you're operating in two or three markets, you then have bigger scale, you can create economies of scale, become more efficient, and so become more competitive. And I think for the first time, really, we're seeing that companies now feel there is strong opportunity to create the scale, to be efficient, to create competitive um, companies because of this coming together of the markets. We asked companies, 28% um, say there's big potential for it, and it's rising. Um, so clearly, um, scale is a big part of achieving efficiency by increasing your size across the region. It's a big part of it. Um, I think another important aspect about expanding in Southeast Asia is the fact that companies are trying to benefit from the diversity in the region. So you have income levels of all different scales. Uh, you have different skill sets. Uh, in Malaysia is a fantastic place to do sophisticated manufacturing. Uh, Vietnam is a good place to do low-cost manufacturing. Singapore is a good place to do financial services. And I think um, Philippines is a good place to do call centers uh, and back office processing. 
So clearly companies recognizing that different countries in ASEAN have different skills and you can actually split up your value chain and put different parts in different places to benefit from that diversity and to get complementarity. Um, we ask companies whether they think ASEAN diversity is positive or negative for their business. You can see the results. Most companies think diversity is very positive uh, and, uh, and so are expanding to benefit from that diversity. <coughs> I think there's also a story here about um, <coughs> diversity being good for innovation and creativity. You know, if you stay within your, own, your home market and that's all you're ever exposed to, you know, those, those, then, then you're never going to experience the new ideas and the new challenges and the new perspectives that come from moving into a different market. Um, and so I think you know, expanding across ASEAN's diversity helps to nurture innovation and creativity in companies by exposing them to different environments, different systems, different wealth levels, and so on. Um, but of course, creating a regional business in Southeast Asia um, is still fraught with challenges. I mentioned the integration process still has a long way to go. We asked our, our um, survey panelists, respondents, to tell us what they thought were the biggest hurdles. This is ranked on a scale from one to five. Um, the number one scale, number one problem in Southeast Asia is an unpredictable legal environment. The fact that if you, uh, there are some places where the legal system is not very reliable, you can get very arbitrary judgments, the rules and regulations are, 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 are the laws are um, often interpreted very arbitrarily. Um, so the unpredictable legal environment, the biggest barrier to creating a regional business in Southeast Asia. Worker shortages is a, is a, is a problem. Uh, Non-tariff barriers, well, we can see all the, uh, all, the, all the things there. But interestingly, cultural diversity, which has always in the past been held up as a big challenge for Southeast Asia, is regarded as the, the least worry in Southeast Asia. It's not something that companies worry about. They're actually regarded um, in a positive light. Um, of course, uh, protectionism is still something that um, is, uh, is quite, uh, ranks quite highly. Um, we asked our um, we asked our survey respondents uh, about protectionism, and um, they said that uh, it varies from country to country. The two places where they find it to be most entrenched and most difficult is Indonesia and Myanmar. Um, Malaysia they find relatively open. They don't think protectionism here is, is too much of an issue. Um, Indonesia clearly um, does have protectionist tendencies and over the last couple of years. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't think there's any danger of, of Malaysia becoming another Greece, um, but you don't want to move in that direction. And, and you know, if you keep rising the national debt, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it needs to be brought, brought back under control, I think. Yeah. It's Indonesia, and Indonesia has got just dramatic uh, uh, FDI story. It's really flavor at the moment. So foreign companies are really desperate to get into Indonesia and buy a piece of serving the domestic market. Um, and in fourth place is Malaysia. So Malaysia ranks fourth, um, and the rest is maintaining it. Um, at the time, two countries both becoming more populist and nationalist in their outlook. So the potential for something to go wrong is much greater. Thank you very much. You need to have an economic system that supports that sustainability aim. What is a concrete solution to you and your team? Uh, because getting rid of these debts just gives you a room to build up these debts again. Yeah. And then... To uh, reorder the uh, economic management of Western economies and their financial systems. Um, and it's been an opportunity, the way that the financial systems run, the way the banks are run, nothing's really changed. Um, and um, I think it's a huge opportunity that's, that's been squandered. Um, I don't necessarily have the answers as to what would be a better system, um, uh, but I think clearly the, the, the way things are run at the moment is, 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 is not um, wise. And the fact that we're in the system going, um, using this sort of cheap money fuel to keep uh, you know, sort of, uh, ones that would be, uh, the West, West would be very wise to, to look at and place it. One last question from Prof. Yeah. Uh, I recall some 